Well, hello everyone and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement 2. On today's video, I'm going to be looking at this Apple Color Monitor 2E, model number A2M2056. This monitor is not working and I'm going to see if I can get it fixed. We'll start with a little tour of this monitor. Let's flip down the little lid. Now there are two versions of this monitor. They both look exactly the same on the outside, but one way you can tell them apart is the hinges on the little door. One type of the door has little, oh, I don't even know what it is. It's like, imagine if you take a piece of plastic and it's very thin and you can bend it and flop it around. That's how the hinge is. But this, I can see actually has metal pins on it. So this door should not come off very easily. But on the other ones, on the other hand, they can break off pretty easily because since it is just sort of like bent plastic that's just flexing, with a little tug, eventually it will come off. Now, I don't remember which monitor is which. I think one is made by Samsung and perhaps the other one is Toshiba. I can't exactly remember. Or no, Hitachi. Hitachi is one manufacturer and Samsung is the other. So we'll find out when we open this thing up what's inside. But the controls on here are pretty simple. There's a power switch on and off, power LED. On this side here, it looks like we have contrast, brightness. This would be, I think, color and then hue. And then there's a button here. And what this button does, which is working okay. That button puts the monitor in monochrome mode. And while it's in monochrome mode, it's also in a very high resolution mode. The CRT that's on this set actually is pretty fine. The dot pitch is pretty fine, which means the 80 columns text renders really well, but only in monochrome mode. For color graphics, Apple IIs use artifact color. It's an NTSC thing. And if you try to look at 80 column text and you've ever used an Apple II, you know that if you have mixed 80 column in a graphical mode, the text is all rainbow colors and it's completely unreadable. But when you push this button in, it changes the entire monitor into a high resolution monochrome monitor that will then render the text nice and sharp. There's also another really cool feature about this monitor that's actually completely unique to the Apple Color Monitor 2E and 2C. Those two monitors, by the way, cosmetically look different, but they're exactly the same on the inside. The cool feature is that while the color killer circuit is enabled, so that means that the NTSC color decoder is not detecting the color burst, it switches the monitor automatically into the high resolution monochrome mode. A typical monitor like the 1084 or the 1702, when the color killer circuit is active, it still has all the video filtering and the notch filtering enabled on the video signal, which results in very soft text. That is not the case on this monitor, which gives you a nice, sharp image. Uh, looking at the rest of this thing, it is, uh, well, let's see, it's pretty dirty. I cleaned up the front a little bit because it was absolutely filthy. Now, looking at the side profile, this monitor is designed to sit on top of the Apple IIe computer. And on top of that, it's designed to sit on top of the Duo drives, which is like a double five and a quarter inch disk drive thing that Apple made. The Duo disk, I think it's called Duo disk, not Duo drive. It is basically, as deep as this part of the monitor right here. So even though this thing has this big overhang here, it's got junk in the trunk, so to speak, there are actually no feet on this part of the monitor. The feet that hold the monitor up are all under this front section because th this part is designed to hang off the back of the Apple IIe. While the Duo Drive sits kind of perfectly on top of the IIe, it would fit under this exact section. So it was all sort of designed, I think, in concert to work together. It's got a fixed power cord, which is um, really, really dirty. Uh, the labels here are coming off, but Apple Color Monitor 2E, it says there, and there's the bottom number I already mentioned. It's got a single composite video input right here. And then we have, looks like horizontal position, vertical position, and vertical size controls. Those are the only three controls available on the back of the monitor. Of course, this is an NTSC monitor being released here in North America, 120 volts. It doesn't have a multi-voltage power supply inside. I'm pretty sure they actually sold this in PAL markets, which means that there is a PAL version of this, uh, I think for sale at least in Australia, but maybe also the UK, that would decode. Well, I'm not sure what it decodes because there are a bunch of different weird Apple IIs that run in 50 hertz markets. Some of them output PAL, some of them output no color, and some of them output NTSC color, but yet at PAL frequencies. I don't know. It's all a bit strange and I don't fully understand all those weird versions, but I think uh, there are matching monitors that go with the matching 2Es that are sold in those various markets. Okay, as per usual for these repair videos, let's remove the back cover. Uh, I do know this monitor does not work. It just doesn't produce any kind of image. 
I don't remember any other specifics. So we'll find out um, what those are when, after we take a look on the inside. Just make sure that nothing looks obviously wrong in there. Alrighty, there we have it. So this is the Hitachi set, because uh, it says Hitachi on the picture tube there. And uh, like I said, I'm pretty sure I've, I've opened some of these before. I've worked on some of these, and I never remember having to remove so many screws from the bottom. So that must be specific to the Hitachi version that I've only worked on the Samsung version, I guess. And I'm pretty sure it's Samsung. Hope I'm not messing that up. All right, well, now this thing is open. One thing I can say about it is this was probably, well, I don't think this was used in a school because this thing has a real aroma of cigarette smoke, which is not great. Um, it doesn't look too dirty on the inside. I mean, there's definitely soot on things, a little bit of it, but I don't think this thing is super high hour, but it's, you know, it's definitely been used. Usually when these things are used around smokers, when you first turn them on or you turn them on and they start to get hot, then they really start to smell and not be so great. Take a look at this right here, by the way. Caution, primary hot common ground is on this bracket. So while this thing has a probably partially isolated design, because of course it has video inputs, it's probably not all isolated, which means that this ground here is part of the hot side of the chassis. It will have like a, a isolated side and a hot side. The hot side, which is going to be running off the B+, which is most certainly not an isolated B+, means that the ground side of that could be at live, depending on if your plug is miswired. Oh, I just noticed there is no third pin on this. Well, actually, so that's kind of a perfect example. So in North America, the two prongs here, um, basically one is smaller than the other, and that's the polarization, and the outlets that are in the wall also have a, a smaller opening than, than the other one. The smaller of those two pins is the hot or the live, so that's the dangerous one. The neutral wire is essentially connected to mains or ground earth in your panel, so it's basically safer, but because the third pin has been ripped off of this, someone must have taken a plier to it, you could plug this in either way. And what that has the effect doing, if you plug it in the wrong way or your outlet's miswired, then this would become referenced to 120 volts, mains live. So touching that, if you weren't using an isolation transformer by working on this set, then that could be pretty dangerous. Now, let's take a look around inside this set a little bit. So I'll move the camera here. So I talked about this on my 1702 video, this right here, this black wire, or no, it wasn't the 1702 video, it was the Sony TV that was all damaged. Uh, this wire here is the degaussing coil, and it makes its way all the way around on both sides and through the bottom. And then you can see this spring right here. This is the CRT ground. It's basically on this DAG here and this wire runs from that to this part of the chassis. Now, this part of the metal chassis is going to be actual earth ground, so the ground pin that's on here that's missing. It's not the same as what's on this. This is the hot side of the power supply, so it's safe to touch this part down here, but it's not safe to touch this. And I can demonstrate that with the multimeter here, so we have it set for continuity, so just listen for the beep. When I touch that together, you hear that beep, so Obviously, the CRT here is going to be grounded to the chassis down here, but on the chassis, we are not grounded to this heat sink. And if we take the missing prong here in the plug, well, it looks like it's completely broken off in there. I gotta kind of dig in there to get it. There we go. Oh, I had it. It beeped for a second. There we go. So the earth ground that's on the mains plug would be going to the chassis here and going to the CRT, but yeah, like I said, this will be, do not touch that while this set is operating, unless you're using an isolation transformer. Looking down into the set here, obviously neck board is intact and it is connected. I'm just checking for any kind of loose cabling and things like that. I don't know if anyone's ever been inside of this. All the wire dressing seems to be pretty good though. So I'm gonna say that, you know, no one's been in here messing around and whatever faults exist in here, are probably just because, well, you know, it's a fault. Something has gone wrong in here. So far, everything is looking good. I'm not seeing any kind of issues that are at least obvious. Now, one thing I'm gonna look for is the uh, the glue that is on a lot of these old monitors that starts to turn, well, it, it gets, what is it, hydroscopic? It absorbs water. And what happens is they, they gunk it around the bottom of the capacitors, usually to keep them from flopping around during shipping or whatever. 
And if it's touching some of the components, like resistors and things that are nearby, when the glue kind of turns this really dark color, it starts to absorb water and then it will corrode anything that it's touching that's metal. Now, I'm not seeing that on here, luckily. There is glue around the, the uh, caps, there's some right there, but it's sort of a clear glue, and I think that is fine. But that dark brown glue, I get, and not only does it corrode things, so you can have like entire components where the legs are missing and stuff, it also becomes conductive because of course it's full of water and whatever the chemicals it's made out of. So it can mess up sensitive analog circuits, but usually in things like monitors like this, the bigger problem is actually the, uh, the components corroding and then like breaking. So you'll find resistors that are actually just snapped in half and you know, things like that. I'm trying to think if I've ever repaired a monitor on the channel that had that problem. I know the little IBM VGA monitor I had had that brown gunk and I spent a bunch of time scraping it all away. And I recently worked on a little Sony Watchman. It was like, a, not a portable one, it was like a mega Watchman. So I had like a, I don't know, four inch regular, you know, tube CRT like this, black and white. It worked, so I didn't, there was no repair video, but I had that thing open. And I noticed that brown glue was in there and some of it was getting very dark which is when it absorbs water. So I was scraping that away using my little pick, which I dropped on the floor. It's uh, right here. This is this is a really great tool for scratching away that stuff because you can really get in there and get it out. So anyhow, okay, um, so far so good. Let's turn this thing up onto its side. Oh, okay, on the bottom, there's a metal cover here, which means bad solder joints that are on the PCB are gonna be that much harder to try to figure out. That's annoying. So I think there's a way, there's probably a way like some screws here to get this entire assembly off. And then you'll have to take out all the screws around the perimeter of to hold the PCB into this metal tray. So I could go check for bad solder joints because I have to say, um, I don't know what's wrong with this thing. I guess we'll plug it in and see what it does, but I wouldn't be surprised if, if bad solder joints are one of the issues here. All right, so let's plug this in. Pull that off. I have my test pattern generator right here. The signal is live, so I'm gonna connect that to the back. I plugged in the AC mains, even though the pin is missing, I made sure to plug it in the correct way so it's it's polarized. I mean, it's getting the correct hot and live. It doesn't matter, it's AC, but just, just to be extra safe. Let's turn this on. In fact, actually, let's grab the app on my phone that will let us um, hear or like, you know, visually see if the high voltage is running and the oscillator is running. This is the app I use, it's called Spectroid. I'm using version 1.12, it's free, it's in the Google Play Store, and of course, it is a spectrum analyzer, so it's perfect for seeing if the monitor is working. In fact, right now, what we're seeing here is like maybe around 10 kilohertz all the way to 25 kilohertz. So if the monitor is working when I turn this on, like the oscillator is running in the horizontal sweep, then we should see the peak appear on the phone. There it is. All right, there it is, 16.5 kilohertz. That is too high, so something is the matter. And obviously, we have high voltage, but we do not have any kind of image at all. Let's see. Let's turn these controls. This is brightness and contrast. Nothing's happening here. Nothing is happening. This button here, nothing. How about we turn it off? Okay, there's a little bit of a flash there. So there's some kind of life in the uh, CRT there. And we're obviously getting high voltage. I feel the static here. And obviously we saw the oscillator is running, but it's plugged into the video input here. So it should be running at 15.7. What I want to do is unplug the video connector on the back here while it's running. And I want to see if this changes. No, it didn't change at all. So basically while the monitor is not plugged into the video signal, the oscillator is gonna be free running and it might not be at the right frequency. That's the horizontal hold control that would be on most TVs. That's basically adjusting the horizontal oscillator. And on this, well, it could be off by a little bit, like it's 16.5, but as soon as you plug in the video signal, it can lock on and it should be 15.7. So it could be that there's just a bad connection from the video connector on the back of the monitor to the PCB that does the processing. So let's turn this off and I'm gonna go investigate a little bit. All right, I've gone ahead and I've unscrewed this uh, PCB plate here. Now the thing is the entire monitor is now disconnected. So you have to be extra careful because there's a bunch of wires that are connecting it, but there's nothing holding 
you know, the CRT up originally, this thing was like a stand. So if I put the CRT on its base here, this metal thing was kind of holding it all up. Well, this is not doing that anymore. So I have to figure out a way to hold the CRT up a different way <laughs> without this metal plate here. So let me see what I can do. On this side over here, there's a ground wire that's this green one, and there's a bunch of like hot glue in it or something, which is making it very difficult to unscrew. I need to get this off, <laughs> but I can't. I'm going to try to dig it out with this little pick here a little bit. I guess they didn't want this screw coming out because it's absolutely critical that the uh, CRT ground, uh, this green wire, be connected to probably the neck board here, wherever this black wire goes to. Oh no, that goes over to the PCB as well. So yeah, this is a, this is a critical component here. All right, uh, let's see, this should be free for the most part. There we go. I think it was just sort of stuck on, there we go. Okay. Let's move this all onto the bench. So this comes free now. All right, so there we go. I was able to kind of move that away. There is uh, some length available in the wires here. See all this? I just have to cut that zip tie. So they give you extra length so you can actually run this in like a service position with the uh, CRT somewhat away from the rest of it. All right, over on this side, I can't really see it, but I took a flat blade screwdriver and I, I dug it into the bench and it's propped up. So the monitor is sort of balancing on that side. This part does sort of hold it up, but I don't really feel comfortable with that. Now you're able to see a little bit more of the PCB. Now there's a white line that starts right there and it kind of snakes its way around the PCB. You can see a little bit more of it near this purple cap. That is indicating which part of the board is live and which part is isolated. And it actually says that, well, it doesn't say it right here, but over there around the line itself, it actually says isolated and live. So it just tells you, stay away from this area, but if you're probing around trying to do troubleshooting, these other areas of the board, like over here where this IC is, are actually, you know, they are safe to touch. I mean, I'm putting safe in quotes. I know the camera zoomed up, safe. Because ultimately, you know, you shouldn't be working in a monitor unless you know what you're doing. But at least if you hook your oscilloscope ground up to say this metal chassis here, which we know is earth ground, then you're not potentially hooking your oscilloscope ground lead, which is connected directly to earth ground, to something that's at mains voltage potential. That would be bad. Now this large chip right here is actually branded Toshiba. Is this thing actually focusing on that? Let me zoom in a little bit. It's very difficult to get the camera to focus on what I want it to focus on, which is this IC. So yeah, Toshiba. There's another IC over here that's branded SGS, along with uh, this part right here. This is also, oh no, this is SST. So I'm not really seeing a whole lot of Hitachi branded stuff on here. So you can't always easily tell by opening up a monitor who makes it. And the fact that the CRT is branded Hitachi doesn't really tell us anything, but I'm pretty sure that the Samsung branded one has a Samsung CRT and a Samsung markings on the board. And this doesn't have that. All right, well, continuing the inspection, I'm noticing a potential problem here. Right there is the RCA jack. It's on the back right here, and it looks like it's pretty mangled up. It's a little bit bent. So I'm assuming this thing got yanked while a cord was plugged into it. And perhaps that actually broke the connection on the underside of the board. I think the only thing I can do at this point is take all the screws out around the perimeter of this thing, and let's lift this board out of the metal chassis take a look at the bottom and try to inspect for a broken solder joint there. Uh, so far getting this thing apart is fiddly because there's this back plate on here, which I really should have taken the screws off of this first because they're on the underside of this. I think this thing is mostly free to come off. Almost there. There's one more screw over here and it's very hard to get to because there's a bunch of connectors in the way. And it gets this little power board off. There it is. I have to say, this thing is not a good example of an easy to service monitor. <laughs> not at all. Lots and lots of screws, and the fact that, that metal plate's underneath here means that you have to do quite a lot of extra work just to get it off. Look at there's another screw right there I gotta take out as well. There's probably some kind of a service position that this thing can get into. 
that is talked about in the service manual, which Apple never published. So who knows what that is, <laughs> but it's probably, I don't even know, what what is it gonna be? Hmm. I'm just trying to figure out how to look underneath this PCB. Let's move this plate out of the way. Okay, there we go, like that. Now I'm not ready to operate this like this because there's still like grounds unhooked and of course the power board is disconnected, but at least I can give this bottom side of the board a thorough inspection. And now you can get a good look at this isolated versus live side of the chassis. So everything inside this white line here is part of the hot chassis. Everything on this side over here is the isolated or safe part. Notice the video connector, which is right here, is on the isolated side of the board. And yeah, it goes through this. Okay, um, first thing I'm gonna do actually is let's uh, get this signal. I'm not gonna power the monitor up. I just wanna hook up the signal into it, which doesn't reach. <laughs> okay, there we go. I could just got it to reach. I'm gonna hook this up. And what it will allow me to do is use the oscilloscope to actually look on here, because a lot of these circuits are passive. I should be able to see the video signal if it's making its way into the board here. Alrighty, here is the oscilloscope here. Let's see if we have a video signal on here. Well, first let's see if we have a video signal on here. All right, there is the video signal right there. So it's definitely coming in on the cable. Just had the settings wrong on the scope there. So we'll clip on here to the ground. It's convenient location. Okay, so we do have a video signal coming in. Now it's lower than what we just saw because there's a terminating resistor here on the monitor which is normal. All right, so that is there. Let me grab my goggles and start tracing out the video signal. Let's see, anything look wrong here? You know, there's nothing looks wrong here at all. This makes its way over here to this inductor, it makes its way across the inductor normally. There's a resistor to ground. That's probably the 75 ohms. Then we have a cap right here. So there, the video signal is there. Now it's on all of these resistors over here. And then there's a cable or no, what is this? No, I don't think it's a cable. I don't know what this is. Oh, it's a transistor, right? There's a transistor right here. So unfortunately we're getting to the point now where we're not gonna be able to trace this anymore. It's on the base of this transistor right here. And so that would be the signal and the monitor will need to be powered up to do any further tracing out of the signal. But I can tell just looking right here that there's a transistor here, it goes to the base, then there's the collector emitters, nicely labeled on the bottom. Then it goes to another transistor, it's like a second little buffer. And then it makes its way over here to, uh, what is that? Is that a switch? Huh, let's take a look. I got a look here. Oh, there's a switch there. Is that the service switch? Hmm. Okay, the serve, there is a service switch right there. All right. All right, well, let's, um, let's hook this back up. I gotta power this monitor up at this point. There is not much else I can do without it powered up, which is scary because now it's gotta, it's gotta work while it's, you know, propped up like this. Okay, I have gloves on, isolation transformers right here. So I'm gonna plug the monitor into this right here. And I think we're ready to do a little bit of troubleshooting. Scope is here. I hooked up the, the ground lead, which you can't see. There it is, the ground lead from the CRT and stuff uh, up to the board here. There's a heat sink right there. That's a nice isolated ground. It's soldered right there. And I'm just gonna give another inspection, just make sure everything looks okay and everything's out of the way, not gonna short. I think, I think we're good. So my intent is to find the video signal making its way over to the circuitry over here and see what I can do to find it over here because it should be going through like, you know, into this IC here. This IC definitely is handling like the sync separation and stuff. So the video signal needs to be over here on one of these pins. So I'm going to start poking around and I have a mirror that's propped up right there so I can glance over here and I can see the front of the glass here just to see if, well, maybe there's a picture all of a sudden. I don't know. We'll find out. All right, let's plug this in to here. Okay. And the monitor, the power switch is connected. Okay. It's running. The monitor is on and running. And the video cable is hooked up. 
So I don't see an image or anything on the front. I don't see anything on there. Uh, one thing I should do actually, why don't I turn the picture control up and let's look to see if we're actually getting raster. Those controls are right here on the uh, flyback transformer. The screen is the bottom of the two here. Oh, there's a, is that a crack? No, that's just a piece of dust. So there it is. We have good raster actually, and that was turning up the screen, which is a uh, grid two usually, and uh, actually looks good. That means if we turned up a lot, so you can see the retrace, there's the retrace. Uh, there's a little bit of dark spots on there. That could be just dirt on the CRT though, to be honest. Oh, look how they're moving a little bit. Um, you, oh, okay, it's flickering the camera quite a bit. Now, now what that sort of tells me is that the problem here is the video circuitry. There's like something going on from the video connector here, like before it gets to the IC for the processing. So we can actually eliminate a bunch of things as working properly because we saw a good raster on the mirror there. So the horizontal is seemingly working perfectly. Now it's running at 16.5. That's probably because the video signal is not getting to this chip. And this chip does the sync separation. Almost certainly this chip does sync separation. And that point, once it gets the signal, it will lock on to 15.7 kilohertz. So we know the horizontal is working. It's free running. We have good high voltage. We have a good horizontal oscillator. And then the vertical is also working because we have, you know, we don't just have a thin line. We actually have, we have proper vertical sweep happening, which is the up and down. So that really tells us right there that there is no problem in this whole section of the board. This is like where all the deflection is happening here. And this IC is what's generating the signals to actually run the deflection. And that's working. So this chip, you know, could be bad still, but because, you know, it, it's doing video processing as well. But it's definitely doing the sweep stuff correctly. So that's why I really think that there's something going on here in the video circuitry, which is going to be probably all this area down here, because there is um, right here, we have uh, some pins that go to a, like a bunch of wires that run to the front controls. So it could be something there, like maybe the brightness is turned all the way down, you know, and that's the issue. And it could be bad pots. I mean, it, it really could be. So I need to start poking around on here and looking for that video signal making its way over to here. Okay, so we go to the base. Uh, it's actually off the top of the scope there. Let's switch this over to AC coupled. That will help us keep our eye on the video signal. Let's uh, move this up. Here we go. So the base of this transistor is looking good. Let's look at the emitter. No, let's look at the collector. All right, let's go down here to this pair. Emitter. Okay, so this is kind of weird. I don't know if these are PMP or NPN transistors. It's probably like a emitter follower pair here because there's two. Uh, the collector, that one goes to the base of this one, but then it's the collector of this one that is going over here. And like, I'm not seeing anything on that. I mean, I do see something, but it's not a proper video signal. That's for sure. There's a resistor here connected to ground. Make, it makes its way over here. That's that same signal that doesn't really look like anything. And it's going to into the chip. It's going into the chip right here. So that's the same signal that's coming out of that transistor over here. And it goes right here to this IC. And that's it. That's not much of a video signal right there. No, it's not. I should have looked at the part number on this IC to see if I could find the data sheet for it, because maybe I could have found the signal this is looking for and then try to inject a video signal right into the IC here. It's pin one, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, it's pin six. So I'm kind of suspecting here that there's a problem with these transistors here, because there is the video signal on the base and nothing except that bad signal, which is what we see over on the IC is coming out of it. So what I'm gonna do is unplug the set here. There it is. And I think I'm gonna desolder this transistor right here. And it just takes a second to get it out there. And I'll put it in the tester. We'll see if that shows good or not. Anyways, there's the transistor. I just got it out. So this will have like a Japanese part number because this is a Japanese made monitor. Uh, C945. I'd have to look up what that is, but I can put this in the tester and we can see if it works. All right, I have this really junky tester here. I need to get a new one because this one sucks. All righty, there it is. It's connected up. Let's test this thing. Okay, NPN. So it is good. The beta 177, 
and six, 600 and, and I think this is like voltage drop 636 millivolts. Okay. All right, I just stuck the top one in the board, the one we know is good, just so I don't mis mix them up. Well, let's get this other one out here. All right, the second one here is an A733, A733. All right, connected up to the tester. Aha, <laughs> that is not a good transistor right there. No, what? I don't even know what this stuff means on here. This thing's like freaking out. Let's, let's just reset this. Okay, uh, T4 isolate probe, what? Uh, is there a reset button on this thing? No. Maybe my tester died here. Let's reset the battery here. Okay, let's try that again with nothing connected. Should say nothing connected. Okay, yeah. Self-test mode. Okay, so yeah, this uh, part must be shorted. That is my assumption. Let's, uh, let's get this off of here. Reset that. I think that this transistor is just dead short. I wouldn't be surprised. So we'll use the multimeter here. Not enough space on my bench. <laughs> Look at all this stuff here. Okay, let's see. I think this is dead short. And I probably would have been able to figure that out in circuit, in the board. But since it was so easy to get out, it's not that big a deal here. Uh, yep. All three legs are shorted together. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> dead transistor. And it's funny, it was the second one, not the first one. So let me go look up what this is. This is, again, A733. Let's find out what that is. Because the other transistor was a NPN. I'm sure this is just going to be a PNP. Yep, PMP, TO92 package, 50 volts. Yeah, 250 milliwatt, 180 megahertz frequency. Now I have this little kit here full of transistors, but these are all NPNs and I don't have any PMPs in there. And, and those aren't gonna be the Japanese pinout, which have, um, I think it's what, collector, collector base emitter. They usually have a different like collector emitter base, I think, so you gotta like bend the pins around. I think I have some in my little bin here. Alrighty, I found a PNP here. Uh, you know, as for the specs, if it's compatible, I don't know. I guess we'll find out. All right, so yeah, PNP and actually uh, EBC, so collector base emitter, it's in the same order as uh, what's on the board here. It's nicely marked. So I just need to make sure I stick it in the correct way. So let's see, uh, the green wire is the collector. So actually it looks like I have to flip this around the opposite of the way it was on um, the, the original part. The original part had the flat part of the package facing towards the desk. And this one, the collector, which is the green wire, needs to be over on the left side. And then the base, which is the black wire on here. I know this is all very hard to see in fiddly, which is the middle. All right, well, I'm just gonna stick this in the board um, and I'm gonna flip it around and we'll see if this makes this monitor work. And I do have to re-solder the other one because it's just uh, sitting in there. All righty, the new part is in. I haven't cropped the legs off. Uh, let me turn the monitor on. Oh no, I gotta plug it in, don't I? We'll just plug this in right here. Oh, sounds a bit different, the monitor. All right, we have an image on the screen. So let's see here. Uh, if we go to the collector, if we go to the collector, there's a video signal. And if we go to that pin on the IC here, which I think was this one, nope, not that one. There it is right there. That is on the IC, that is the video signal now getting through. Now, whether it's a good image or not, I don't know. Let me uh, turn the screen control back down because I have it too high. All right, well, you can see it on there. There's a rolling image. Let's adjust these controls here. One of these is probably vertical hold. There it is. Okay, so the monitor, it's got an image. Wow, the pots are very scratchy. I know you can't really see that very well, but there it is. If I move my bottle out of the way, you can see that there's a color image. It's not good looking. I think the that's tint. The color pot is not working very well. Like it's very scratchy. I'm gonna have to get in there and try to clean these pots because uh, they are not working that well. And I think this monitor might be pretty worn out too. Okay, and then the monochrome switch that is working. That goes between high res and monochrome. Yeah, but I can't get a good color image. I can't get any of this to look good. It looks terrible. 
because the color control is no good. Okay, time to clean the pots. Now, one thing that's interesting as well is now that there's a video signal going into the monitor that's a good signal, it's actually making a different sound. You can hear the vertical refresh circuit working. It makes this sort of ticking noise at 60 hertz. So you hear this like sound, it's very faint, but that is that you can definitely hear that. And I wasn't hearing that before. And I think that's because while there was vertical sweep, we saw vertical, it wasn't locked onto a video signal and it, it just didn't seem to make that noise. And so that's another indicator that you know that a good video signal is getting through. If there was something wrong with like the uh, neck board, for instance, this circuitry would be working and it would be driving the, the horizontal and vertical sweep and that would all be working. But of course you'd have no image and you'd still be hearing that sound. So you're listening carefully for that 60 Hertz sound, which is the uh, refresh, I guess 50, if you're in a country that runs at 50 Hertz. Okay, I gotta try to clean those pots. Now the bad image quality that we might've been seeing there, maybe that was due to the fact that I was using an MPN or a PMP transistor that it's not totally happy with. Like it should be something more appropriate for video circuitry. Uh, I don't even know which, where, I had a little box with the parts in there and I think I put it away. So I didn't even look at what the part number was on the transistor I just stuck in here, but I'll look it up in a second. All right, let's see if I can get to those pots with the uh, QD electric cleaner here. And that would be a negative. The, there's a PCB in there and it's of course hard to get to like everything else on this monitor. So I gotta try to, I gotta try to access it now. Let's move this stuff out of the way and I'm gonna pause the camera while I fiddle around with this thing. Oh God. Okay, I have the monitor on its side. The control panel is out here. This thing is really a pain to work on. I really have to say, not very easy to service. I'm assuming that technicians who work on a lot of CRTs probably have some kind of little like jigs to hold the thing up. Like it would hook on the bottom here and be a little triangle to prop the screen up if you're working on it like this. Of course, I don't have anything like that. So it's not so easy for me. Let's get these cleaned in here. All right, now I have to try to get them back in here, which is a bit of a pain. So here we go. Okay, the control panel's back in. I just cropped the legs off of the bottom of the PCB there. Let's tilt this back over since it doesn't need to be standing up anymore. I'm definitely gonna run the monitor again, make sure I can get the picture looking better than it was looking, look terrible, because maybe I do need to switch out that transistor again. Let's grab this uh, clip lead that fell on the ground. Alrighty, that is good. Let's make sure everything else is okay. Yep, everything looks good. The degaussing coil's not connected, but that's okay. Alrighty, I think we're ready for power up again. Here we go. Let's hope there's no smoke that comes out. Okay, it's running. How do I have these controls set up? They're probably just all at crazy settings. Let's just adjust them to the middles. All right, so the pots aren't scratchy anymore, but there is no color signal it's very faint. So I'm thinking that the, uh, I think this transistor is probably inappropriate for this use case. There has to be the color burst signal making its way through to the circuitry. And I guess it's not because I have the color turned all the way up and there is really nothing visible. In fact, when I put it in monochrome mode, you should be able to see the dot pattern as well. And I'm not seeing that. I think that transistor is not appropriate for this use. So I gotta go find an appropriate PMP transistor. And I wish I had that little box full of them because <laughs> that would make my life a lot easier. Also, the overall image quality is just terrible. Like it just doesn't look good. It's all like washed out. And again, that's probably that transistor. But as you can see, we're making progress. There are color bars on there and the image looks okay. I'd say the CRT is a little bit tired, but um, we should have much better color than that. So I'm gonna go dig into my spare parts. Look at my hands, they're getting a bit dirty. I'm gonna find myself a new transistor. Okay, I haven't found a transistor yet, but I wanted to demonstrate why there's no color information. Right here on the scope, we're looking at one of the scan lines and there should be basically a color burst signal right here. And then we should be seeing up and downs, um, you know, like it's going like this, showing the high frequency data that makes up color. Well, we're not seeing it there, right? I'm currently on the PMP transistor with the scope right there on the collector, which is the output. Now, if I take the scope probe off and we move it to the lead on the video signal itself that's coming from the test pattern generator, um, it's a little bit lower amplitude, but if we, we can fix that by just altering this, 
Okay, there it is. And you can see there's a lot more going on here. I'm gonna to try to pause it. There it is. So this is what we're looking at. There's the color burst, very clear. And then that's color information. When I was on that transistor, that was just barely anything and there was really nothing there as well. So that high frequency data or information is being filtered out. Maybe it's because the two transistors aren't a matched pair. And that's the problem because I actually looked up the specs on the PMP transistor right there and it said it was up to 200 megahertz, which is plenty good, but clearly it's not actually working. So this is a question I have to ask Frank, just unplugging the monitor there. It's a question I need to ask Frank because he's much more of an expert on this analog stuff than me. But in the meantime, while he's still sleeping, I'm gonna go try to find a, a matched pair from my spare parts because I, I know that the problem exists in that part of the circuit. That's why the image has no color. As for the rest of the washed outness, I don't know, but the color, definitely being filtered right there. So I'm gonna go look for parts now. Alrighty, I have gone ahead and I replaced that transistor. I actually found another one, uh, seven, it's an A733, but it's a P version. And remember that this original transistor that I took out of here was also an A733, you can't really see it there, but, but that's what it is. So the difference was, and I used my tester, is that this did have the base and the collector pins swapped around and the legs were short because I took this off another board. So I had to install a little bodge there, which I, as usual, don't know if you can even see, but that just swapped the two legs around. And I found it on one of these old boards here. I have a box full of, uh, like this box here, just full of old CRT parts, stuff that I've like junked, like TVs and old monitors that were too far gone, like the CRTs were wasted on them. So I sometimes, well, I usually keep the board and I e-waste the rest of it. And it's uh, served a lot of use. I've pulled parts off of all of these caps, high voltage caps and who knows what else. But yeah, I just looked around at the transistors, looked up the part numbers, and then I saw the A733. So hopefully that's gonna do the trick. So that means it is now time for testing. I have not tested this to see if it works or not. This will be the first time. So let's just make sure all this stuff is okay. We gotta hook the clip lead back up. This keeps falling off here. Okay, there we go. Um, I think everything else is good. Yeah, ready for testing. So I'm gonna plug this back into the isolation transformer here. Okay, monitor's on. Are we going to have a better picture? Oh yes, we do everyone. Right off the bat, we do. You should be able to see in the mirror there. Things are looking way better. Let's get this tint control set right. Yeah, the monitor, still, the picture looks bad though. Okay, that's brightness, that's set correctly. This is contrast. So that's contrast all the way up. And uh, yeah, it doesn't look that good. Not to mention the tint is far off. Yeah, not a very bright CRT at all, not bright. Uh, zoom, tried to zoom in. Unfortunately, it seems to be focusing on the actual mirror, not on the image that's in it. But you can see that it's, uh, it's there. Okay, it's now time to put this thing back together, at least put that bottom tray back on. There are still plenty of controls that I could try to adjust to make the picture look better than the crap that it looks like right now. But I'd rather do it when the thing is not so precarious on the desk like this. All right, the monitor is uh, reassembled. For the most part, I just haven't done the wire dressing. Let's get the power cord and plug this thing in. Okay, it's in the isolation transformer. I'm just gonna do one more check, make sure ground leads are connected. All right, I think we're good. Here we go. Okay, powered on. Let's turn off the studio light. All right, there it is. There is the image. Looking pretty crap. As I said, contrast is maxed out right now. That's brightness all the way down, brightness all the way up. Yeah, this looks pretty terrible, <laughs> pretty terrible. So in monochrome mode, now I see the nice dot pattern, of course, as we should. And it definitely is looking on the yellow side. I thought it looked good when I turned the screen up, but um, yeah, here it's on the yellow side. So there are some controls on the side right here for the drive controls. I'm gonna tweak those. All right, so this is, uh, looks like the red. Next is this one, which is the blue, obviously. And a lot of times you can't adjust one of the drives. This one appears to be uh, the green, you can't. This is the bias control here. 
We have a sub brightness control right here on the side. So that probably doesn't need to be adjusted. Let's take this, uh, get rid of this field here. This monitor is having issues down here in the corner. Hmm. I think it's blooming actually. Actually, I'm not sure what's going on there with this. That looks messed up. Oh, well, here we are. It's about 30 minutes later, at least. I've spent quite a bit of time fiddling around. And in fact, I was reading some service documentation for another Hitachi monitor. I even went into service mode, which collapses the vertical deflection. So you turn down the screen and you can adjust the um, bias controls that way. And then the drive controls once it's up and it looks terrible. This monitor absolutely looks terrible. If I crank the bias controls all the way up, then we actually get a bit of a brighter image. As you can see, as I crank these way up, so we, we get a brighter image there, but the brightness is now too high. And thing is now the grayscale is all messed up. I had the bias control set appropriately, so the grayscale was better. The contrast control is maxed out. And if I turn the brightness down to, you know, where you're not seeing a bunch of gray down here, it looks okay on the camera, I know. That looks okay. But it's super, super dim. This is not really usable anymore. Yeah, if you're in a dark room like I am right now, it'd be fine. But if you try to use this in a bright room, you'd barely be able to see an image on this thing. Let me keep cranking on these bias controls. Okay, that one's all the way up. That's the blue bias control. How about this one here? This will be green. So the green gun on this CRT is the strongest of all. So I have to turn that down because the blue is all the way up. And how about this one here? And the red is decently strong as well. But now there's the drive controls and there is only a blue and a red drive. There's no actual adjustment for the, the green one. That's like a fixed value. Right, there we go. Turn the screen control down. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, it's just the CRT here is completely worn out and super tired. And there's just no way to make this thing look good because the CRT is spent. Now, I'm sure there are people watching this right now who are like, change the caps. That'll fix this. That That is not the case. The image we're getting is plenty sharp. We're getting perfect deflection. There's no distortions in the image. There's no weird ripples or anything that are an indicator of bad caps. I have worked on enough CRTs. Oh, by the way, this bar right here, that is just like the signal generator is perfectly synchronized to the camera. So if I move the camera up and down, you see how it moves and it's kind of unfortunate. I wonder if I can change the shutter speed here. Okay, let's see if I can make it go away. No, I can't. Yeah, unfortunately, it's just funny that the signal generator has a really stable clock and it's very, very close to the camera. So on some things, you're going to see that bar move slightly. And I think it does move slightly, but it moves ever so slowly. Anyhow, back to what I was saying. I worked on enough CRTs to know that the problem with this one, besides the transistor that I replaced that was bad, is this CRT is spent and needs to be replaced if this monitor were to ever work properly. And unfortunately, this CRT is a pretty high resolution CRT. It's not the same TV quality one that you'd find in like a little 13 inch TV or say a, even a Commodore 1702. This CRT is actually much more similar to the ones that are in Commodore 1084 monitors because it's designed for displaying 80 column text. And therefore, the actual little phosphor spots on this, the dot pitch, so to speak, is very fine, meaning the spots are really small. That gives for a high resolution image, but it also blocks a lot of the electrons from getting to the phosphor, which results in a dimmer image. So you have to increase the brightness and the contrast to get a bright, bright image, which drives the CRT hard and wears out the CRT faster. The harder you drive the cathodes to get a bright image on a high resolution screen, the quicker they wear out and the dimmer it will get. And that is what happened to this. I don't know what took this out of service, whether that transistor failed and this was taken out of service because of that, or it was taken out of service because the image had gotten so dim. All right, so the one thing about this monitor is it's never been very good at displaying non-Apple II graphics. I don't know what it is about it. It just, it, I don't know, it never looks that good, at least from what I've tried. It's not like the 1702, which looks amazing displaying anything. But the Apple II hooked up here. Uh, there's the color. 
I mean, it's still dim, unfortunately. It's very sharp, though. If I do PR number three, I get some 80 column text there. I mean, it's absolutely readable. It's so much sharper than the 1702. It's really a great monitor for an Apple II. This is pretty much perfect for that. And there we are with Total Replay loaded up and, you know, the colors look okay. Let's scroll through some of the games here. It's, you know, it's all right. It's really not bad at all. I mean, like I said, this monitor produces nice, good um, color graphics on the Apple II and you push this button and then look how sharp it is. Look at this text there, it's perfectly sharp. That's the benefit of that button. So there it is with the lights on, it produces an image. <laughs> I set out to fix this thing. I wanted to figure out what was wrong. I figured it out, it was that bad transistor. We found the right part that went in here and there it is, it's working. It's producing an image. I'd have to give this thing like a C minus though when it comes to picture quality. It's just relatively displeasing, but I personally am a picky person and this image is probably fine to someone who just wants to recreate like their Apple IIe setup with, uh, you know, some kind of an image. It's, it's usable, absolutely is usable. It's just far, far away from what it looked like when this thing was new. So there it is. I think I'm gonna end this video here. There it is, the Apple IIe color monitor. This thing was basically gonna be left for dead, recycled because it wasn't working at all. Now it works, so someone can use this thing. And yeah, so hopefully you figured out that even without schematics, with a little bit of logical thinking, you can trace your way through the circuit and figure out where the issue might be. When it comes to composite color monitors like this one and the 1702, for instance, there's just not a lot of difference from one monitor to another. Yeah, the parts, you know, the, the circuitry, the layout is different, the chips are different, but they all generally work the same way, even television sets as well. So you can just use the process of elimination to kind of figure out like what's working, what's not working when you look at it, and then zero in on the part of the circuit that's not working. And that's what we did here. So I hope you learned something. If you liked this video, thumbs up. If you didn't, you know what to do. Thanks to my patrons. Their names are scrolling up the side of the screen over here. And, you know, comment down below, put your thoughts, questions, all those usual things. And I guess that's going to be that. So stay healthy, stay safe, and I will see you next time. Bye.